forward the uh, the files about reactor intermediates because the internet was down last evening, so he couldn't do that. But he will. He would. He has the material. He will forward it as soon as he's able to. Okay. So now we're going. So today we're going to do four sessions. Remember, one is brought forward from tomorrow. Um, on the third topic, and this is organometallic reagents. And remember, the the three topics are dealing with situations where it's not easy to think in terms of electrophile, nucleophile. Uh, the mechanisms don't neatly fit into that. And here we're going to be looking at catalytic cycles. And this, of course, this area of organometallic reagents, coupling reactions, and metathesis has grown enormously in the last uh, 10 to 15 years. So what I'm going to look at is in, so lectures 9, 10, 11, and 12, that's numbered in sequence since last Monday, um, will be today, and then we'll do uh, a final one in this block tomorrow. So <clears throat> the first session now is going to introduce the D-block transition metals, a bit about metal ligand bonding. Um, I'm an organic chemist, so you're not going to get a very theoretical or inorganic view of this. You're going to get my view of this. Um, and then talk about some palladium catalyzed coupling reactions. The second session will continue talking about palladium reactions. And then tomorrow we'll look at, uh, uh, sorry, I beg your pardon, this afternoon, lectures 11 and 12, we'll look at uh, ruthenium catalyzed reactions which really in this context means metathesis reactions and then a little bit about gold mediated reactions towards the end of this afternoon. So that's the uh, program for this this block as you might call it. So we should begin this uh, first session before our break <coughs> talking about introduction to D-block transition metals, metal ligand bonding and talking about some palladium catalyzed coupling reactions, in particular in this first session, the Heck and Stille reactions. So, here we have the transition metal and lanthanide blocks, and just to place the metals we're going to look at in context, uh, you can see uh, palladium there marked in red, you can see ruthenium in blue, and gold in the bottom row in yellow. This shows where they fit into the periodic table, into those transition metals. <clears throat> and if you were looking at learning outcomes for most uh, university type courses, in this area these days, you would see the learning outcomes that are listed above, an understanding of the importance of, that you should gain an understanding of the importance of organometallic chemistry in contemporary organic synthesis. We're going to see a lot of examples of where that's been used. To recognize the key steps within any palladium, ruthenium, or gold catalyzed reaction and rationally devise plausible mechanisms and catalytic cycles. So that's what I hope you can gain out of what we're going to do in these lectures. And then look at examples of applying that to the synthesis of complex molecules. So we're going to take those metals in a sense in order, palladium, ruthenium, gold. <clears throat> Just to remind you something about electronic structure, Generally, in a chemical environment, an S orbital in a certain shell is higher in energy than the D orbitals of the uh, shell below. So, 
if you look in the top row there, written titanium, I'm writing it as 3D24S2. So, because the uh, S orbital is really higher in energy, we can regard that as 3D4 in its outer shell. And it's the D orbitals that we're concerned with here um, to give us the unique chemistry of the transition metals. And because those d orbitals are only partially occupied until we get to the right hand side, zinc, cadmium, mercury, etc., uh, then we get the possibility of filled orbit a mixture of filled orbitals and empty orbitals, and that allows us to have electron uh, donor and acceptor properties. Another thing we should think about is that transition metals like to achieve 18 valence electrons, 18, valence, 18 electrons in their outer shell. So if you look at a couple of, uh, or a complex there, nickel uh, tetracarbonyl has 18 electrons. How is that made up? It's 3D84S2, so that's, that accounts for 10 valence shell electrons and four carbon monoxide ligands and they bind through what can be regarded as the electron pair on, uh, on the carbon of carbon monoxide and that provides then another eight electrons to make the total of 18. Zero valent or nickel zero complex nickel cyclooctadiene, two of those that again has 18 electrons, 3D84S2, and two cyclooctadiene uh, ligands, each of which is providing four, uh, four pi electrons because two of the bonds in the cycle, yes, two of the uh, double bonds in the cyclooctadiene uh, complex in each cyclooctadiene complex to the nickel. So we're looking to find 18 electron rule. General transition metals will attempt to attain 18 valence electrons when forming complexes. But as the, if you can read that line at the bottom, it's not a foolproof uh, situation. So there are cases where transition metals don't uh, have 18 electrons, but more often than not, they're trying to achieve 18 electrons. And if there aren't 18 electrons, then reactivity arises. And uh, certainly in some of the palladium cycles, we'll make use of that. <coughs> now the d orbitals I spoke about, just to remind you what the d orbitals look like, is the dz squared orbital, there's the d x squared minus y squared orbital where the lobes of the orbital are, are along the various axes then we have three combinations where the lobes of the orbitals can be regarded as being between a pair of axes and so we've got dyz, dxy and dzx so that's the set of orbitals we're dealing with so um, a mixed set of geometries some of which will come in when I look at uh, bonding. <clears throat> so this is a simplistic organic chemist's view of bonding. So here will be metal carbonyls where carbon monoxide is the ligand, is carbon monoxide, and you can regard it as C minus triple bond O plus And that means, so the C minus, if you like, is a lone pair on the carbon in a, an sp orbital. So that's a filled orbital. And then we have lots of pi bonds, but we also have pi antibonding orbitals. So I've drawn there, this is met, that says pi star, it's a bit fuzzy on the screen. But this is an antibonding pi orbital. So we have an empty orbital and we have a filled orbital. And that, that will match in complexation with a filled 
D orbital and an empty orbital on the metal. <coughs> so that you can have complexation where these two filled and empty pair have a sort of sigma type overlap and then you have the filled D orbitals on the metal interacting with the empty pi star orbitals on the carbon monoxide. So that's a way of explaining the complexation. We have sigma bonding, donation of electrons from the ligand to an empty orbital on the metal, that's here to here, and we have pi bonding, donation of electrons from the d orbital on the metal to an empty pi orbital on the ligand, so the pi antibonding orbital in this case. You can do a similar thing with, uh, with alkenes to form alkene complexes, and so again the same filled d orbitals, vacant uh, orbital on the metal, the corresponding situation with an alkene would be an empty pi star orbital again. The filled orbital now will be the pi bond orbital. So to get that interaction, we've got to sort of turn the metal sideways, sorry, turn the alkene sideways so the pi bonding orbital can interact with empty orbitals on the metal and the uh, Filled orbitals, filled d orbitals on the metal can interact with the antibonding orbital of the pi bond. So it's sort of sideways on complexation. <coughs> this term at the bottom, synergistic bonding, mean is really uh, saying that the two types of bonding, the sigma bonding uh, donation from the ligand and the pi bonding donation from the metal to the ligand are uh, operating in opposite directions but they are producing the same result so they are reinforcing each other <coughs> a type of ligand that we'll see in many of the catalytic cycles is uh, a phosphine type ligand and here what we're looking at same situation with the metal filled d orbitals and there and there are empty orbitals on the ligand we're going to have a lone pair on phosphorus so that's our filled <coughs> sigma type orbital and we're going to have empty sigma antibonding orbitals along e uh, from each of these groups along each of these bond, dis uh, bond directions of the groups around phosphorus. So we have a number of empty sigma star orbitals that can, uh, sigma antibonding orbitals that can participate. So you can see the picture now filled and empty orbitals on the metal, filled and empty orbitals on the ligand and you can see how that will give the same type of uh, synergistic bonding. And with the phosphorus you can set up a, a scale of sigma donation, in other words how good they are at forming uh, these sigma type donor bonds and therefore in the complexes. I mentioned when we were talking about n-heterocyclic carbenes that those, that the, the carbene carbon in those systems is a, a sigma donor and uh, hence, I haven't drawn it here, but hence why the n-heterocyclic carbenes can also, or can replace phosphorus in many complexes. <coughs> we can do the same things with alkynes as well as, as, as we did with alkenes. Um, turn them on their side, and again we've got filled pi orbitals, empty pi antibonding orbitals, and the same synergistic bonding with metals, so uh, pi to sigma donation uh, from the alkyne, and d to pi star donation, pi type donation uh, from the alkyne.
Now you don't necessarily need to remember all of that, but all I'm trying to show is how the uh, ligand bonding can occur with transition metals and the significance of d orbitals to that. When it comes to the chemistry, we just that's underlying, and we don't have to be looking at that all the time. And the first bits I'm going to talk about uh, in this session and the next one are palladium catalyzed cross couplings, and uh, the importance of of the growth of this area was recognized in 2010 by the joint award of Nobel Prize to Heck, who has a reaction named after him, Nagishi, um, we'll see Nagishi's contribution in the second session today, and Suzuki, and we'll see his contribution in the uh, second session as well. Uh, Stilly, whose reaction I mentioned earlier, unfortunately passed away, so as I mentioned with Woodward, could not, uh, did not get a Nobel Prize because they can't be awarded posthumously. <coughs> so let's look at that, let's take the Heck reaction first. It's slightly different to the, some, to the Stilly, Suzuki, etc. So what we're looking at is coupling a, an organic group carrying a leaving group with an alkene, cut, uh, catalyzed by palladium. So that's a very general expression of it. The uh, group that can be involved in the coupling can be alkenyl, it can be aryl, not so usually alkyl, although that is just about possible nowadays, but originally these were sp2 type uh, linkages to a le the leaving group being a halide or a triflate. The alkene that it's coupling to can be part of an aromatic, uh, can be sorry, substituted with an aromatic ring, an alkyl or an alkenyl or a withdrawing group and so on. So all so most alkenes could take part. And here's the sort of thing that could happen. This is an aromatic iodide, so this is your R1X component. And uh, that, the carbon carrying the iodine, is linked one, two, three, four, five, six, linked to this position on the alkene. Now notice that the alkene you get in the product is not in the same place as it would have been in the starting material, which would be down there. And the way that the alkene, the alkene is broken and then reforms in this mechanism, and you'll see why the position of the alkene in the product isn't always uh, reflective of where it starts. Now, another point to make here is that this is these processes need palladium two. Uh, sorry, need palladium. I beg your pardon. This, these processes need palladium zero, and we're starting here with palladium two. But I should make the point that palladium two, in the presence of triphenylphosphine or other phosphines, is actually reduced. And at the bottom here, we show how that uh, one way of looking at how that might happen. Here's palladium-2 acetate. The palladium-2 can pick up two triphenylphosphines as a ligand. You can get a reductive elimination between two of those ligands to give you an acetoxyphosphonium salt, which hydrolyzes to triphenylphosphine oxide and acetic acid, ethanoic acid. That would leave that's, that's a reductive elimination, so it leaves palladium zero with one phosphine, one acetate ligand left, and that, for example, might exchange the remaining acetate for another phosphine. So we would end, we can end up having yes. started, sorry. Yes. Thanks. In the second step, there is one acetate attached to palladium. So I think this oxidation state would be one. Well, this one. Next. That one. Next. Uh, 
do that. Um, Oh, you got me there. You might be right, but it certainly ends up at palladium zero. Yeah, you might have a point there. I need to think about that. As I said, I'm an, I'm an organic chemist, so I'm just taking this on trust from elsewhere. Um, yeah, you may have a point. Certainly, but the, I think that what I'm trying to get at is that you end up with palladium zero. So even if you, I suppose the general point is, regardless of how it happens, which I'm, I'm that may be wrongly written, um, we are going from palladium two reductively to palladium zero. Now, if you have a reductive elimination, you're going to have a, you should have an oxidation state change of two. Now, I think that's, I think that is correct. However, I will have, I'll check that. But I say the point, the overall point is that palladium zero is the active catalyst, and this is a, if you like, a pre catalyst situation. So we need to think about how this is happening. So whether you put in palladium zero directly, that example I showed had palladium acetate but it is possible to put in palladium zero uh, complexes directly. But either way, if you put in pal palladium zero or palladium two in the presence of a reducing situation like, um, like triphenylphosphine or phosphines in general, the idea is you end up with a, a palladium with a number of ligands around it. It seems likely that the palladium here is either 14 or 16 electrons, and of course that would depend on how many ligands there are. In one sense, it doesn't really matter. Uh, in another sense, I can't be too definite here because I think nobody exactly knows, and it's probably a mixture of possibilities. But the key is we have palladium zero, can do an oxidative addition effectively inserting into the bond between an organic group and a leaving group, let's say that's a halide, to give a palladium-2 complex where the organic group and the leaving group are both uh, are now extra ligands on the palladium. What happens next is an, effectively an addition across the alkene that is going into the heck reaction. So that's one of the substrates. This is the other substrate. And you get effectively an addition across here where uh, palladium adds to one, or it ends up bonded by addition to one end of the alkene and the alkyl, uh, the, sorry, the organic group on the other end. So, that's called an in, a migratory insertion because the alkene is inserted between the palladium and the organic group. And uh, in fact, I, if you look at it the other way around, you can regard it as an addition across the alkene. Now, a key point to note here is the stereochemistry. The addition is syn. So the organic group and the palladium are add on to the same face of the alkene. That's going, that's going to matter because we now want to get the alkene back again because we formed a new carbon-carbon bond. So here's our one, our organic group, here's our alkene. So we formed a new carbon-carbon bond but we don't really want to end up with this carbon-palladium bond and we want the palladium to be catalytic here. But we can't get the uh, sort of reverse of the addition that happened until there is a, a CC bond rotation. Because what we want to, and um, we could reverse the way we, but that's no good going back the way we came. 
What we want to do is eliminate palladium and something else, ideally palladium, well not ideally, but we want to eliminate palladium and hydrogen to get a palladium hydride complex. To do that, the, the geometry of the eliminating groups, the hydrogen and the palladium, has to be the same as the geometry of the groups when they added, when it was an organic group in a palladium. So we have to be able to have a bond rotation to get the palladium and hydrogen syn to one another. And then you get a syn palladium hydride elimination. So if you like, these across the system, these look equivalent to each other. But one has the organic group on the palladium and the hydrogen on the al alkene effectively. And the other side, we have the hydrogen on the palladium and the organic group on the alkene. We still have palladium 2 here, so we have a reductive elimination across there, usually with an added base, because you're trying to eliminate H and a leaving group, so H plus X minus effectively, so uh, a base will assist in the removal of the proton and then the leaving group will come off. That takes us back to palladium 0, ready to go around again. So that's how the catalytic cycle works. And in fact, a lot of the catalytic cycles we'll see in this and the next session have, have common features. There'll be an oxidative addition, and the, at the beginning, there'll be a reductive elimination at the end, and there'll be some organic transformations happening in between. This diagram over here is just really to show you the uh, to say a little bit more about that rotation, just to draw it in Newman projection terms. And that, if you like, as this rotates to put that hydrogen in the sin position, that will determine the geometry of the uh, new uh, alkene that's formed. In this particular case, the way I've drawn it, then you'll see that the geometry change overall is replaced this hydrogen by that uh, organic group with maintenance of the rest of the uh, substituent positions around the uh, double bond. So the key points here are start with an oxidative addition, do an, ad do a, an addition across an alkene or a migratory insertion of an alkene into the palladium organic group bond. Adjust your adduct so that there is a possibility of a syn elimination of a palladium hydride and then regenerate by reductive elimination the palladium zero complex. And so we've gone from this red organic group with a leaving group and this blue out alkene to this coupled product. So we think about some aspects of that. The regiochemistry, it's a carbopalladation, so it's addition of a, a cross an alkene of, the, of an organic group on the palladium and the palladium itself. So you call that a carbopalladation, could give a mixture of intermediates. In other words, which, if you have an unsymmetrical alkene like that, which end will the palladium go to and which end will the organic group go to? Tends to be substrate controlled. In other words, tends to be determined by the, uh, the substituents you have on the alkene. The beta hydride elimination step must go by a syn periplanar mechanism, so the palladium must have a hydrogen syn to it. And as we'll see, that may cause uh, the alkene not to end up in the same place as it started, because there isn't a hydrogen, or there isn't the possibility of, of that rotation to put the hydrogen in the right place, so it has to eliminate with a, with a hydrogen from a different carbon. So the regiochemistry, in other words, which end the, uh, the palladium and the organic group add, 
tends to be dominated by steric interactions. So more often than not, the organic group is placed furthest from the bulky group on the alkene, with the possible exception of some electron-rich alkenes. So here, for, if you look at this uh, alkene with a withdrawing group on it, the organic group couples to the remote position almost exclusively. The same if you have a phenyl on, or an aromatic group on one end of your alkene, the remote position, the least substituted position, tends to be uh, almost exclusive product. If it's an alkyl substituted alkene, again, the, the least substituted position is the majority product, but you can get mixtures. So 80-20 is just a typical mixture, it's not always 80-20. Um, with a di-substituted situation, it will depend on the two substituents. But here's an example. If you have uh, an alkyl group and a phenyl group, still the, uh, the least sterically demanding group, the methyl group, uh, addition next to that, or at that end of the alkene can dominate. So that's something you have to consider. Oh, uh, and another on the top here. Let's say you get addition to the end of an alkene. That's, I'm implying that that's the most common thing. Then this, and then you've got a palladium which can actually eliminate palladium hydride to give the alkene back where it started or the other way. And sometimes, and if, this, if the positions where the eliminating hydrogens are situated, if those have two hydrogens, then depending on which hydrogen is eliminated and which side, you'll get different regioisomers and you can get different geometric isomers, depending on which H's are involved in the elimination. So ideally, you'd like to be able to pre-plan that by fixing uh, limited possibilities. And some of the examples I show you will be like that, where the elimination takes place because that's the only way it can go. <clears throat> so here's an example of a HEC coupling that's intramolecular and we've got a sequence of HEC couplings occurring. So here's an iodoalkene. We'll get initial oxidative addition into that carbon iodine bond to give a, a, a pallad an iodopalladium complex at that position. Then that palladium is looking to find an alkene to, or alkyne to react with. We'll go for the more electron dense uh, alkyne. Complex to it sideways on it first. Then oxidatively insert, or put it another way, add across the alkyne. That's if you like a first oxidative insertion, a first heck reaction, but then in this case, because there is another alkene in the molecule, we can get effectively a second heck type reaction to form a second ring. So this new uh, iodopalladium complex can complex sideways on to the remaining alkene and then add across it now, this time, the, it adds to the more substituted end of the alkene because it's easier to form a six-membered ring than a seven-membered ring if it added to the outside end. So here, what I said about uh, adding to the least substituted end of the alkene is overruled by the preference for a six-membered ring over a seven-membered ring and then a palladium uh, hydride elimination to finish it off. 
Now there isn't any problem with the palladium hydride elimination. It can only go one way because it's a terminal position and this rotation around the the carbon-carbon bond that will allow the palladium to be sin to the remaining hydrogen that it's going to eliminate with. So I think that's a good illustration uh, of how you can design, in this case, a, a cascade reaction, a <coughs> tandem reaction, to uh, produce two rings at once. The Palladium uh, catalyst here is palladium zero straight away, so it's not a free catalyst that needs to be reduced. This example uses palladium zero anyway, three mole percent, that's reasonably high but not too bad. And the base there is helping with the oxidative elimination at the end of the cycle to get rid of the, uh, of the H, or it'll be HI in this case, to regenerate the palladium zero to go around the cycle again. The bottom sequence is showing another similar situation where lots of uh, sequence of rings is being formed. Here four rings are being formed, but it's the same kind of principle. Here is the, I, the uh, alkenyl iodide, drawn in a funny geometry, but otherwise it gets, it, the picture, drawing the picture gets a bit difficult. But the initial oxidative addition takes place down here. That organopalladium uh, complex adds across the first alkyne to give a new one, which then adds across the second alkyne to give a new palladium complex, which adds to an alkene here, which gives an, another palladium complex, which adds to the final alkene and then it's over on this right hand side here is where the elimination of palladium hydride will take place. So I think those are good uh, illustrations of HEC reaction followed by another HEC reaction because it's been, the, it's been built into the substrate. So in a sense what you could say is it was, it's worth the effort of putting together these complex backbones uh, because you're in the in one coupling step you're getting a lot a lot of complexity out of a relatively uh, well an acyclic molecule I was going to say linear but it isn't really linear but uh, out of a, a molecule not having any rings in it you're getting two rings in this example and four rings here which is perhaps pushing it to the extreme but as you can see, it's quite efficient, 76% yield. I, I think that's just accidental at 76 in both cases. There's no significance in that. Here are some more examples. There's actually an error in this bit of the slide here. That bracket with a two round should be on these carbons, not those. It's just kind of slipped in the software when drawing. So I apologize for that. So what is happening is the Palladium is oxidatively adding there, that's uh, adding across this alkene. So that's why this should be a single carbon here with then two carbons and the vinyl group. So that should be two, that, that brackets and two should be round there. And then that's the second, that's set up for us, the second heck reaction in that sequence. <coughs> This, uh, this example, oxidative addition to the aromatic iodide, same as in the above, then that aromatic iodide complexes and then adds across the alkene in the five-membered ring attached. This one is then stuck. If the carbon group attached to the palladium and the palladium itself add on the same face that will be the either both of those will add up to the top face or both to the bottom face of the um, of the alkene 
But that means you can't get the rotation, so you can't get, that's a, that's a sort of a dashed bond, but it's too short to show properly. But what it means, so the, the palladium is sin to the organic group it brought in, but it cannot become ever sin to the hydrogen that would put the double bond back where it used to be. So this is an example where the palladium is forced to eliminate in the, in the other direction. So effectively the alkene moves from where it was in the substrates to where it is in the product. And that illustrates that if you can't get the sin carbon palladium and carbon hydrogen bond, then you can't get the elimination in that direction and the molecule has to choose to go the other way. Here's some other, so that wasn't if you, what you might call an unexpected product, although actually you could have predicted it because the, uh, you can't get the sin arrangement. Um, here's another one, oxidative addition across here, and this, so AR refers to this group, so that's adding, that and the palladium are adding sin, across the cyclopentene, but again, or I suppose, yeah, uh, yes, you're not allowed to, you can't do a rotation around the bond here because of the five-membered ring. So this is another one where the uh, elimination has to go in the opposite direction so that you get effect, what looks like a movement of the double bond around, but it isn't coupling to what was a saturated carbon there is the double bond being forced to move around because of where there is a, a syn hydrogen to allow it to eliminate. Here's a here's one where it doesn't where a little bit more than that happens. So uh, Triflate is the leaving group, oxidative addition of the palladium here, coupling, or as then addition I should say, across the double bond here. Then it looks as if the uh, palladium hydrogen elimination ought to take place, can't take place, well, that's right, it can't take place where the alkene started out could go the other way. So you'd expect to find this product. In fact, for reasons that I don't think are well understood, palladium and hy palladium hydride actually re-adds to this alkene, but with palladium at the opposite end. Here it was at the top left-hand corner of the ring, then it's assumed that it adds again, but the, in the opposite orientation, and then eliminates in a new direction, then in fact adds again, and eliminates again, so the alkene has effectively warped around the ring. Now that must be because this product is more thermodynamically stable than that one but I'm not quite sure how you'd predict that. So occasionally, you can see this, this sort of thing happening. It's unusual, but when you see it, then you have to understand that it's probably thermodynamically driven, and you've got reversible palladium hydride additions where it could, in certain cases, allow the double bond to walk further away than you might expect. So say that again, first of all, that there's the elimination where well, you can't eliminate where the alkene used to be, you can eliminate the other direction, that's what you might expect, but then you get palladium hydride re-addition in the opposite orientation to the way it just eliminated, then you, in this case, it's then eliminating 
in the opposite way to which it, uh, to the way it was formed, and then doing doing that same addition elimination in opposite direction uh, for one final step. So that is that has to be thermodynamically driven, but I don't know that you would predict that before you start on that sequence. <clears throat> so that's the Heck reaction. And now to finish off this session, stilly coupling. Okay, we have an organic group carrying a leaving group again. What we're now doing is coupling that to a double bond carrying a tin residue. Now in the HEC reaction we were going to add across a double bond and then reform the double bond. Here we're going to get a direct coupling between this alkyl or this uh, ar uh, organic group and the carbon carrying the tin. And that doesn't, that can't happen directly so it's got to go via the intermediacy of a palladium catalyst. This is a very generally written equation. You can also do that coupling where you, the organic group and the carbon carrying the tin don't couple directly, they're in between them you get a carbonyl group. So that's if you do the reaction with, in the presence of carbon monoxide. So it's a, effectively, a, our group is usually benzylic, alkenyl, aryl or allyl. So this is usually an sp2 coupling to an sp2 position, so an sp2, sp2 coupling. And, and you can, as I say, get an, effectively an insertion of carbon monoxide between them. So here's just a couple of examples of that before we look at the mechanism. So here's uh, an uh, aromatic bromide as the R1X group. Palladium zero, a bit of base, etc. Here's the, the uh, carbon carrying a tin residue. And so that carbon and the bromide carbon coupled together. And another example down here with a triflate as the leaving group. Uh, palladium zero, note the inorganic salt here, lithium chloride, that will appear in the, um, in the mechanism where you have a triflate uh, leaving group. And again, the, uh, this, this vinyl tin compound, and that couples to the position where the leaving group, the triflate, was. So how is that happening? That's, that's what happens. Now, how, how does it happen? If the leaving group is a halide, this is what the cycle looks like. So we have a palladium zero uh, complex. Again, it's believed to be either 14 or 16 electrons. Um, no one's quite sure in each individual case, and it could be a mixture. Then we get oxidative addition to our organic group carrying a leaving group, carrying a halide, to give us the now palladium-2 complex with the organic group and the leaving group both attached. You then get effectively a transmetallation. So you've got a, the other organic group that we're interested in that's attached to tin, doesn't have to be tributyl tin, can be others, that's why I've put alkyl in there, but a tin, uh, so you've got the group you want to couple attached to tin residue, a uh, tin uh, nucleus, and then that swaps. The group that was on tin goes on to the palladium, and the group at the X group, the leaving group that's on palladium, goes on to the tin. So that's a, that's, it's a transmetallation. This R1 group is transmetallated from tin to palladium. That's the key step here, because now the two groups we want to couple together are both 
on the palladium, so you get a reductive elimination, which takes you back to palladium zero <coughs> for the palladium, but couples together uh, two sp2 centers. So that's a relatively uh, simple um, catalytic cycle. <clears throat> it's a little bit uh, more complex if the leaving group is not a halide but is a, a triflate, then it's believed you still get the oxidative addition, but you then get exchange of the triflate leaving group for a halide leaving group by addition of, as we saw before, lithium chloride, but a metal halide salt. <coughs> that gives this complex, which looks just like the one if the leaving group had been uh, halide. We then, as I say, swap the group that's on tin to palladium and vice versa. So a halide ends up on tin. So effectively, we're just adding this step in to the cycle that I showed on the last slide. Do the transmetallation, and you're set up for the reductive elimination again. So here's got some examples, just before we finish. Here's a very simple one. This alkenyl iodide, this vinyl tributyl tin compound, and the uh, palladium oxidatively adds into the CI bond here. This example shows the carbon, the carbon monoxide insertion into the carbon palladium bond here before the transmetallation effectively. So this is adding a step into the cycle before the transmetallation. Carbon monoxide inserts here to give an acyl palladium complex. Then you get the transmetallation with this vinyl group going onto the palladium and then reductive elimination to join this carbon to that carbon. And another example showing a coupling with <coughs> carbon monoxide insertion in it. <coughs> this is a triflate one. Actually, it hasn't got a, a, you know, okay, so in this case, it doesn't have the halide for triflate exchange in there. Okay, I think that's the last example I've got there. So that's the end of this session. The uh, Suzuki and, and similar reactions that are at the beginning of the next session are a little bit like the Stille reaction in terms of the, of the catalytic cycle. We just play games with uh, do we use tin or do we use other uh, metal species here instead of tin. So still he uses tin, but keep that in mind when I show you the other reactions in the, rem in the next session. Okay, so that's time to take a break. And we'll, we'll come, if we can come back again at 11.30. It's in the same as in the um, in the cycles here. You need to do it's. It won't happen. I mean, nothing happens if you, if you haven't got the tin compound. The palladium compound won't do anything. So it's an exchange between palladium, palladium and tin. So you introduce your alkyl group, your organic group, on one metal, and it then moves on to the tin. It moves on to the palladium. Say. And you'll see in these others that it doesn't have to be tin, there are other options. Or we'll see, I think, boron, magnesium, 
and zinc in the, sub in the subsequent reactions, but they're there for transmetallation. You can form the organic group attached to tin or some other metals, 